isolated thing. This was the pattern of Abraham's life. Abimelech then took sheep and oxen and male and female servants and gave them to Abraham and restored his wife Sarah to him. Abimelech said, Behold, my land is before you. Settle wherever you please. To Sarah he said, Behold, I have given your brother a thousand pieces of silver. Behold, it is your vindication before all who are with you and before all men. You are what? Clear, vindicated. Abraham prayed to God, and God healed Abimelech and his wife and his maid so that they bore children. For the Lord had closed fast all the wounds of the household of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. Now, there is a significant difference between what's going on here and what went on in Egypt. The difference is God goes shock and awe on these people. Why? This is the important point. I always thought if, if, if this is something that is a, uh, a pattern of Abraham's life, why is it we needed to see another one of these when we already saw the application point in Genesis chapter 12? I struggled a little bit this week with how am I going to apply it, but I've already said all of this in another message. Okay? But notice the difference. The difference is what God does to the king of Gerar. Why does he do this? Why does God go immediately to shut the wounds of the women and to threaten the life of the king if you so much as touch her. What did the text say? Verse 6. I have also kept you from sinning against me. Verse 16. To Sarah he said, I have given your brother a thousand pieces of silver. Behold, it is your vindication before all who are with you, before all men you are clear. I want to fast forward to several thousand years later. An angel comes to Mary and says, Behold, you are with child. Now, we recognize that as we call it the what birth? The virgin birth. Do you think anybody at that time bought the whole virgin birth story any more than skeptics do today? No. Actually, in John chapter 8, you see the religious leaders pushing back and calling Jesus' mother an adulteress because of what she did. They didn't buy the whole virgin birth story either. But what does God do here to guard the integrity of his faithfulness to his promises to Sarah? You see, at this point, God has promised in the previous chapter, Sarah, you're going to have a son, and you're going to call his name what? Isaac. In Genesis chapter 21, we're going to see the fulfillment of that. At this point, Sarah's pregnant. Can you imagine what would happen for the rest of history if there had not been the vindication of her innocence here? God promised Abraham from your loins is going to come a son. Well, now because of Abraham's sin, that promise is in jeopardy. Or at least on the surface. Now people for the rest of Isaac's life can go, yeah, right, you're Abraham's kid. We know what happened when you were in Gerar. And God steps in to ensure the integrity of what he has promised to Abraham. God steps in and keeps the integrity of his promise. You see, when it comes to what God has promised, God will ensure his promises are fulfilled. God will ensure his promises are fulfilled. We see this throughout the New Testament as well. Matthew chapter 5, verse 18. Jesus said, For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until it is accomplished. Uh, one of the other translations say not one jot or tittle. Those are just little teeny Hebrew uh, uh, markings to let you know this is one type of letter versus another. They're so small that when I would take my Hebrew tests, sometimes I would miss it and get the point wrong. And all of you know how much I hate being wrong. Okay? Yeah, even one point. Jesus' point is not one little dash is going to disappear until all is fulfilled. When God makes promises, he will ensure that his promises are fulfilled. Romans chapter 11, we see the same idea. In this passage, Paul is talking about God's faithfulness to the promises that he's made to Israel. And some look at the promises to Israel and go, well, they messed up. They failed to keep the law of Moses. Therefore, God has permanently set aside Israel. He has replaced Israel with the church. 
That's what many people believe today. But what does Paul say? I say then that they did not stumble so as to fall, did they? May it never be. But by the transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous. Even the rejection that came from the people of Israel towards God was part of what God was doing to fulfill his promises. And what do we find? Scripture is very clear that one day God will resume his dealings with Israel and he will redeem Israel. We see this in the New Covenant that God promised in Jeremiah 31 and Ezekiel 36 and Hosea that he is going to restore his working with Israel in spite of their rejection. They had blown it in a major way. Jesus was walking with them. We see even in the passage of Scripture that was read today by Richard that uh, Jesus said, uh, uh, greater than the Sabbath. They talk about uh, how the Son of Man is greater than the Sabbath. Jesus was in their midst and they blew it. And even that, God says, he is going to resume his workings with Israel because when God makes a promise, he will ensure that his promises are fulfilled. This is true, point number one, despite my sin. God will ensure his promises are fulfilled despite my sin. Genesis chapter 20, verse 2 again. Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. That was wrong, and he ought not have done that. That was sin. That was lying, and that was pushing his wife into adultery. First of all, what kind of man does that? What kind of a man forces his wife to sin? I've been uh, uh, privileged to be involved in many counseling relationships, and I've seen a lot of rough stuff. And some of the worst is when a husband tells his wife, you're going to do this. Even though we say it's wrong, even though the Word of God says it's wrong, this is what I'm telling you to do. Husbands, we don't have authority to do that, do we? We never have the authority to push our wives into doing what's wrong. That's, that, that's evil. And yet, Abraham does that. If I was God, I'd go, yeah, you're done, dude. You, you, you blew that. That was a big no-no. What's interesting is that in 2 Peter chapter 3, uh, I'm sorry, 1 Peter chapter 3, we are even told as husbands, uh, verse 7, dwell with your wives in an understanding way as with somebody weaker. Not somebody weaker in the sense of can't do, but as somebody fragile, as somebody precious, as something like uh, on a mantle that you don't want to break. Dwell with your wives in an understanding way as with somebody weaker since she is a woman, and treat her uh, kindly as a fellow heir of the grace of life, so that your prayers will not be hindered. God chooses not to hear the prayers of husbands who don't treat their wives with gentleness and respect. When we pray as husbands, but we've not been treating our wives with gentleness and grace and understanding, God goes like this until you get your attitude right. That's a, that's a big warning to us men. That being said, Abraham does horrible things right here. And if I was God, I'd say, yeah, you went too far. Out of fear, Abraham was willing to lie and give up his life to protect himself. And yet God protected them from derailing the fulfillment of his promises. Many times I feel like I've sinned too greatly to be forgiven. I've gone too far. But when we feel that we have gone too far and that God can no longer fulfill his promises because of our sin, we underestimate the power of the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen? When we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 through 4, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Which sins did Jesus die for? Just the not so bad ones, right? Jesus died for sins. It doesn't specify which kind. Why? Because Jesus paid the penalty for capital sin. All sin. The penalty died with Christ. Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 through 15. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him. Having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. Jesus Christ finished work on the cross. 
says that God is not limited by my sinful choices. God is not going, what am I going to do with you now? Look at what you've done with your life. I can't use you. Listen, Jesus paid the penalty in full. Your sin will not keep God from using you. Your sin will not derail what God has planned for you. But then number two, despite my circumstances, God will ensure his promises are fulfilled despite my circumstances. Again, Genesis chapter 2, or 20 verse 2, Abraham said of Sarah his wife, she is my sister. So what does this lead to? So Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. Now I want you to think about this. Like, this is a habit of Abraham's life. <clears throat> Apparently this has happened on more than one occasion. Sarah is like 90 something now. And yet, everyone who meets her is like, sure, I want to marry this one. Sarah must have been like a really good looking 90 year old, right? That's what I'm thinking. I'm like, everybody wants to be married to Sarah. So Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. Abraham's wife is now living in the house of Abimelech. How is God going to keep his promises now? But then what do we find in Isaiah chapter 46, verses 10 to 11? He says, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things which have not been done. My purpose will be established, and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. Calling a bird of prey from the, the east, the man of my, pur of my purpose from a far country, truly I have spoken, truly I will bring it to pass. I have landed, surely I will do it. Do you see any hint there that God is worried by our decisions? Do you see any hint there that God's going, oh no, what am I going to do? He chose left when I wanted him to go right. One of the things that I really struggled with in trying to decide my education, I was trying to decide, okay, I love counseling, I love biblical counseling, I want to go into that field, but I also love academia, I love theology, I want to go into that field. Do I pursue my doctorate in counseling? Do I pursue my doctorate in theology? I don't know. You have no idea. For you guys, this is like, look, big deal. For me, this was a not eating, not sleeping decision. And finally, I had one person, uh, Jeff Newman from Faith, uh, sit me down and say, Jariah, do you think God's really up in heaven going, oh no, he chose the wrong doctor? <laughs> no. Okay? Um, God is not limited by our circumstances. We make a lot of big deals about, well, do I go to the right or do I go to the left? What about this thing that God has allowed in my life? Oh no, look at what, what is going on in my marriage. Look at what's going on with my kids. Look what's going on with my health. Now I can't do what God is calling me to do. Listen, God is not derailed by situations and your circumstances, even if they are a result of the sinful choices that you've made. God does not have plan B. God does not have plan C. God has plan A, and his plan will come to pass. There are times when either due to the consequences of our sin or due to the hard situations we find ourselves in that we add two and two together and get 22 and we don't know how God is going to make four. We don't know how he's going to accomplish his will in our lives, but God will do whatever it takes to accomplish what he has promised will come to pass. God will ensure his promises are fulfilled. Now, that does not mean that I can do whatever I want because God's going to bless it anyway. God's sovereignty is never an excuse to sin. God's sovereignty is never an excuse to sin. When God commands things, he expects us to obey. Listen, God will accomplish his purposes in your life. But your experience of him accomplishing your purposes and his purposes in your life will be different depending on how you obey. Let me give you an example. My kid's toy room. We have a rule at our house that uh, our kids cannot watch TV, play on tablet, no electronics of any kind if their bedrooms and their toy room are not picked up. I'm not going to hound them every single time it's a mess, but every time they say, well, can we watch TV? Is your toy room picked up or your bedroom's picked up? Now, eventually, it goes long enough that daddy has to get involved. And then I tell them, your toy room is going to get picked up. It's either going to get picked up because you went and picked it up, or it's going to get picked up the daddy way. And the daddy way involves a big black sack. Okay, that's the daddy way. I hardly ever have to help with the toy room. It's amazing. Okay? Listen, it will be cleaned up. 
either by them putting things away or by me removing things that are not picked up. God's will will be done. But that process will either be joyful or grievous, depending uh, on whether that process will be joyful or grievous depends on your obedience to what he has commanded in his word. God's will accomplishes purposes. That can either be a plus for you or it can be an excruciating experience if you're not walking with him. Even when God takes us through hard things for our good, we can still have joy when we focus on obedience in the midst of situations, tribulations. When we look at this account, we see this pattern in Abraham's life. We see his sin of asking his wife to do an immoral thing. We see his sin of not trusting God, of lying, of deceiving. We see the situations that pile up. Now Sarah is there in the house of Abimelech, but God ensured that his promises would be kept and that there would be no doubt who had worked. Again, verse 6. I also kept you from sinning against me. Verse 16, Behold, I have given your brother a thousand pieces of silver, but behold, it is your vindication before all who are with you, and before all men you are cleared. When God makes a promise, you can take that to the bank. But if you will not walk in obedience to him, your experience will come of, of his fulfillment will come through heartache, it will come through pain, it will come through suffering. But if you will obey him, you may still go through hard things. Oftentimes, hard things are the very thing that God uses to bring about his promises. But you will have joy in the midst of them because you're pleasing your heavenly Father. As we come to the end of Genesis chapter 20, and we get ready to, uh, not next week, but the week after, look at the birth of Isaac, we see this great fulfillment of what God has done. And we're reminded of the wonderful promise that God can't make promises he can't keep. Because he is too holy to lie, too powerful to fail, and too loving to walk with. Amen.